look, you know, we got one night, uh, yeah. and and uh, preacher asked me what I was going to talk about, so I figured, okay, look, I only got one chance, so we're just going to give you two thousand years of history. <laughs> hey, hey, squeeze two thousand years in, and uh, uh, we're going to open your Bibles, if you, if you will, to Acts chapter six. Uh, I'm not, I'm not teaching out of that. I just want to see if it's in your version. <laughs> but um, uh, we are. We're going to look at the. Um, we're going to look at the Bible from the originals to the one that is in your lap, and uh, and we will we will go from there. We we'll start with the point of origin. That's not the man origin. This actually is the beginning. Okay. Uh, and where it all got started. I'll tell you where it got started, guys. Uh, this in itself, what I'm about to give you, is a two-hour lesson. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the whole lesson. But just very simply, yeah. Antioch. Amen. Okay? Yeah. Now, I've been working on this uh, subject for 40 years. Yeah. Uh, I've I read uh, probably a couple hundred, or at least a hundred books. And um, uh, I mean, I read some stuff that, that is like punishment. <laughs> okay? Do you know what is drier than a British author? A hundred year old British author. <laughs> I had this one I had this one book. It was it was two volumes, a thousand pages, written in eighteen seventy one by I'm the first person to read those volumes. The way I know is you know when they print them, they're folded over and then they, when they cut them, they cuts cuts and these weren't completely cut through. Some of the pages were still folded. I'd take a knife and I'll be honest with you, cutting that book with a knife was the most fun part. <laughs> uh, that Brit had 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 paragraphs that were four and a half pages long. Wow. Now, I think you should go to jail <laughs> if you have paragraphs that are four and a half pages long. Uh, and, and to be honest, guys, I don't mean this bad, but generally people are lazy. You say, yeah. people, that's you. That's, right. that's you. Yeah. Um, uh, there's stuff on the table. If you'll take the time to read it, that means turn your TV off. Uh, you can actually equip yourself uh, for the battle. And uh, and most most folks don't want to equip themselves. They just want somebody else to do the battle uh, for them. But um, uh, you may not have 40 years to study, and you may not be able to get. I got one book. This one book. Uh, it was written in the 1800s, and <clears throat> um, there were only 250 copies printed. And you know how sometimes the first letter. Uh, of a uh, chapter is very ornate. Mm -hmm. Well, when this guy had his book printed, he there was no first letter. Every chapter, like it was the word the, it just had H-E and a big blank space. And then he hand did each le the first letter of every chapter in color calligraphy. Okay? Wow. Now, you're not going to come across that. You say, well, yeah, you know, I don't have 40 years and I don't want to read 100 books. Well, you know, I always say this, if, if I asked you what chapter in the Bible shows you how much God loves you more than any other chapter, mm -hmm. somebody would say John 3, because 16 is in there. Some would say, you know, Romans 5, because uh, verse 8 and 9 are in there. Uh, I say Acts chapter 6. Now, I know that didn't come to your mind, but, but I appreciate somebody that loves me, and I appreciate somebody that helps me cut to the chase, and God lets us cut to the chase. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, and, and this is the ultimate question. If you're going to deal with anybody... Uh, about the King James Bible. This is the first question. If you do not ask this question, then just go home. The first question you ask them is this. Do you accept the Bible as your final authority Amen. in all matters of faith and practice? Amen. Now, if they say no, you're done. Amen. Right? Amen. And if they say yes, they just disqualified their Greek professor, their own education, and every, every other scholar's work. Amen. That's right. And, and I've had them say that, you know, and then I don't, I, they aren't going to change. You say, well, you, you ever hear this? You show me where I'm wrong from the Bible, I'll change what I believe. That's a lie. <laughs> yeah. Show me where I'm wrong from the Bible, I'll find three more verses that say I'm right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's that's what you're going to do. Yeah. But, um, but if you really accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters, you say all matters, yes, all matters of faith and practice. There's only two places that you get manuscripts from. You get them from Alexandria, Egypt, and Antioch in Syria. That's right. That's right. God loves you so much, you don't have to read 100 books. You don't have to read 50 books. You don't have to read 25 books. You don't have to read 10 books. Are we getting anywhere near where you want to be? Yeah. You don't have to read five books. How about you don't have to read one book? Are you getting happy yet? Yeah. <laughs> How about this? You don't have to read one entire chapter of a book. Now are we in your league? <laughs> How about you don't even have to read ten whole verses? 
Amen. Look what it says here, Acts chapter 6. This is a, I, you know, I'm not one of those people that thinks the original church was a Baptist church, but this makes me think it was, because it says, uh, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring. <laughs> Guys, that's not Baptist doctrine, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Uh, of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the day of uh, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them uh, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you uh, seven men of honest report. All right, would you say honest report is a positive or negative connotation? Positive. Positive. Yeah, yeah, I mean positive. It's, it's a, a description that probably will never be used to describe our president. <laughs> Full of the Holy Ghost, another one. <laughs> and wisdom. Whoa! <laughs> this guy's a three time winner. Uh, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves uh, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the saints, uh, the ministry of the word. Now, now watch this in verse 5. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy, uh, Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenes, and Nicholas, a proselyte of. Antioch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, that is the first time in your Bible that the word Antioch appears, mm -hmm. and it appears in a connotation of a man who is full of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. wisdom, and of honest report. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So you see right there, probably no one from Antioch ever served in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> now look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians mm -hmm. and of them of Cilicia of Asia disputing with Stephen. <laughs> so, so guys, here in mm -hmm. Acts chapter 6, mm -hmm. in verse 5, you have the first mention of Antioch. In verse 9, that's the first mention of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. The first mention of Antioch is positive. The first mention Amen. of Alexandria is negative. Yep. And if you really accepted the Bible as your final authority, you don't need anything more. Amen. You really, that's how simple God made this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to wonder why we're going to go for another hour and a half after this. <laughs> but uh, that's what we're going to do. So, so I want you to know the point of origin is, uh, is Antioch. Uh, and, and I told you, the, um, uh, the whole lesson on that uh, is, uh, uh, is an hour, hour and a half. The short, the short one is an hour and a half, and the long one is two hours. Uh, after this, and this is, probably, this is probably where many of the originals were written. Uh, and then after this, you have the, um, uh, the versions. The early versions, okay? Uh, the Bible was translated into several different languages. We're going to just give you, um, uh, I'll write a bunch of them down here and I'll give you the prominent ones. Uh, one of the most important was the Peshito, and that is in Syrian. Uh, I told you, Antioch is in Syria. That was the Syrian church, Antioch. Uh, it was on the uh, Arantas River. Uh, Antioch was like Houston. They... Uh, they rode horses and had... No, no, that's no. Um, it was like Houston. It was inland. Houston is 50 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, but it is a seaport because they have a ship's channel. Well, Antioch was not on the shore of the Mediterranean, but it was up the Arantas River. was also a, 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 a seaport. And so uh, uh, Antioch, by the, by the end of the very first century in Christianity, there were over 100,000 Christians in Antioch. Mm. Uh, it was the head, it was the headquarters of the New Testament church. <coughs> you hear people talking about the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem? May have been one. That may be why God moved to Antioch. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so, so one of the most prominent uh, of the early translations or early versions was the Peshito. That was uh, the language of the early of the uh, church there. Uh, you've got um, Coptic. Um, Ethiopic. Slavonic. Boharic. Now these were these were copies or, or, or uh, translations uh, of the Antioch manuscripts into these languages. Uh, I told you the Peshitta was one of the one of the major ones. Uh, Arminian. There was no Calvinist one, <laughs> and they're mad about it to this day. Um, there was the Old Latin, 
And the old Latin was a was a uh, prominent one. Uh, the old Latin <clears throat> was the was the church or was the language was the Bible uh, of the uh, uh, the Church of Europe. Uh, Latin was the because of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Latin was the language that people used, and so old Latin was uh, was important. This one, Pashido, was done about 150 A.D. This one was done about 157, so it's right there in the second century. Uh, the old Latin Bible, be, in fact, in fact, to show you. You, want to, you know the word you want to remember? Common. <clears throat> yeah. That's, the Bible says well, about Jesus Christ, the common men heard him gladly. Amen. Let me tell you, there are two crowds out here. Uh, I am a writer. And when you write books on this subject, you will address one of those two crowds. You will address academia, or you will address the people in the pew. Whichever one you address, the other will either be offended or get nothing from it. Right. Uh, if you address academia, um, it goes over your head, guys. I'm sorry. It does. I'm working on a book right now. I've been working on it for eight years. It's going gonna, it's gonna to catalog all 5,800 manuscripts of the New Testament, tell you what portion of Scripture uh, they have in them. It's going to chart them. Tell you what year they were written. I've got the I've got the name of some of the um, scribes that did it. Where they are on planet Earth. What condition? I was over in London last year. They pulled a couple of manuscripts to the British Library. Looked them over. Had some stuff to the, to the book. And and to be honest, you're going to want it, but it ain't going to do you a bit of good. And that is uh, that it's it's really it would be a good reference book for a guy that doesn't believe the King James Bible because it'll have uh, that information. So if you address academia, the guy in the pew doesn't get anything. But let me tell you something. It's the guy in the pew with a Bible in his hand that the devil's afraid of. Amen. Yeah. So what you do is you sit around a bunch of, uh, uh, of brains going, Oh, Dr. Smith, your treatise on the second heiress tense there in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 was just, uh, it was just monumental. And that is literally what these guys do. But if you address the guy in the pew, academia is offended. And oh man, they will give you down the road. There are a couple academics uh, that that claim to be Bible believers are really TR guys, uh, and they they absolutely hate my guts. You know why? I've never, I've never even met them. They say they believe what I believe. You say, then what's the problem? I write to you. I don't write. I ignore them. But common is the word. Peshito is the Syrian word for common. Mm -hmm. Latin, that old Latin became the common Bible, so it became known as the vulgar. We think of vulgar as, uh, as somebody cussing, but that's not it. Vulgar simply meant common. Mm -hmm. So that old, that old Latin became known as the Vulgate. Okay? And it was the language of the New Testament church. Or the, or the Bible of the New Testament church. Um, and then you got this one. And this is a very important one. You got Wycliffe, and that's uh, 380. That's a lot of caliber guys. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not 380, 1380. Whoa, get that right, 1380. Uh, 1380 did New Testament, 1382 got the Old Testament, uh, but that was that was the first time the Bible was translated into uh, into English, and that's where it was all going to go. God's always used one language. He used one language. You don't hear everybody say this, well, there's a perfect Bible in English, and there's got to be a perfect Bible in French. Why would God want the French to have a Bible? Could you tell me? <laughs> I mean, next thing you know, they're going to be saved, and they're going to be in heaven with us. But, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, but anyway, um, but yeah, there's got to be a perfect Bible in Italian, there's got to be a perfect Bible in every language, Chinese. No, no, that, no, that doesn't. God inspired the Old Testament in one language, and Amen. you know what he basically said? If you want access to the perfect word of God, learn Hebrew. There you go. Amen. When he inspired the New Testament, he, learned, he inspired it in one language, Greek. He didn't even inspire it in the language of his chosen people, the Jews. How do you think a Jew feels when God says this? You want access to my Bible now? Go learn a dog's language. Because that's what we are, right? And so when you put them together, now this is just a theory that I have. But uh, I kind of think that the language was going to be Latin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the cross, what were the three languages? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really do. I think that um, I think the, the third language was going to be Latin. You say, well, what happened to it? The great whore yeah, that's right. made it her official language. And if you want something cursed, mm 
Yeah. Have Rome bless you. Amen. I've been That's trying right. to get this president to go over and get a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> I wish the Pope would bless the whole Congress, you know. But um, and and so God had to put it in some language. And so uh, in 1380, uh, Wycliffe had his. Uh, and then there's another one that is important. And that's German. Mm -hmm. And in 1517, uh, that is when uh, uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door of the chapel of Wittenberg, I think it's 1524, uh, that he translated uh, the Bible into German. And, and the, the importance of that version is that that is the match that ignited what we now know as the Reformation. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, like I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those guys that thinks that Jesus was a Baptist and started Baptist churches. But I do agree that we are not Protestants because no. Protestants Amen. came out of the Catholic right. Church. Right. 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 And, and we, are, we are the remnant or we are in the line uh, that runs parallel. Here's the true church. Here's the false church. We've never been in the false church. Amen. Okay. Amen. Now, Amen. some of us were. How many of you were Catholic before you got saved? Okay, so we're kind of Protestants. <laughs> you know, we're kind of, but we didn't come out. But, um, um, and this is, but, but here's the thing. Uh, Luther had his problems, but that, I'll tell you what that one did. That broke the hold that the Roman Catholic Church had on all of Europe. That's right. and, and here was Europe, uh, and the Catholic Church had it, and that, that Reformation just... It so damaged the power of the Roman Catholic Church that they haven't got it back yet. Amen. Amen. Even though it is as whipped out as Lutherans are today, yeah. they still aren't back in the church. Yeah. Yeah. As lame as the Anglicans are, mm -hmm. they're still not back in the Catholic Church. Sorry. And though we are not Protestants, I want you to know that every single independent King James Bible the Baptist Church in this country has benefited from, from that Reformation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. So those are the uh, those are the early uh, the early translations. I'll give you some of the um, uh, some of the Greek testaments. Now, you do understand this, you know, I always tell Americans to think because Americans quit thinking uh, the day after they got their TV sets. <laughs> And uh, most of them, most of them can't have a thought unless they have a remote <laughs> in their hand. But uh, uh, I'll do it up here. I'll just erase this. Oh, it's not what I want to do. And we'll look at the Greek text. Uh, and what I was going to say is, here's here's what you need to think about. You do understand there has never, ever, ever been a time in history when the 27 original autographs of the New Testament were in one binding. That's right. Exactly. Amen. Nobody ever picked up a book like this with everything from, from what Matthew wrote to what John wrote in Revelation. In fact, they were never in the same room at the mm -hmm. same time. In fact, stop and think. Weren't Paul's books called epistles? Mm -hmm. What's an epistle? Letter. It's a letter. 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 Okay, what do you do with a letter? Send you send it. You think he you think he held 1 Corinthians till he had 2 Corinthians so somebody could photocopy it? <laughs> you stop and think that that some of these were mailed to Corinth, some went to Thessalonica, some went to Rome, some went to Ephesus, some went to Philippi. Paul even had one that wasn't even inspired. Mm -hmm. Called the Epistle of the Laodiceans. If they dug it up today, if they said, hey, we have proof positive that this book was written, this manuscript we found was written by the Apostle Paul, it needs to be added to the Bible. If it was inspired, buddy, it'd already be in the Bible. Right. Yeah. Okay? But, um, so you say, well, when did that Greek text get collated? It got collated by a guy by the name of Desiderius Erasmus. Now, those are two really good names to not give your kid. <laughs> <laughs> Desiderius Erasmus. Uh, 14, what is it, uh, 66 to 1536. And Erasmus collated the Greek New Testament. <clears throat> he had five editions. His first one was 1516, second was 1519, third was 1522, fourth was 1520. Uh, let me consult my, my memory. Seven. <laughs> And 1535. Um, 
the, the real, the real uh, change in the game is right here, 1522. The first two editions that Erasmus, uh, Erasmus published did not have 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a Greek manuscript that had it in. And he made this statement. He said, you find me a Greek manuscript with it in, I'll put it in. Now, now here's the folklore about this. And the folklore, the, the legend, uh, false, is that somebody went out and manufactured two Greek manuscripts <clears throat> with it in, and then handed them to him, basically with the ink still wet on them, saying, here they are, there's 1 John, so you've got to put it in. Um, Erasmus wanted it in. Now, <clears throat> I got a book, and even though it's a book written by, uh, by scholarship, critical of the King James Bible, they let the cat out of the bag on something. Uh, they had a copy of a letter written by Erasmus that, that Erasmus received in 1521. This letter came from Bombassus. Bombassus was the prefect of the, of the library at Rome. You know the custodian of Vaticanus? Mm -hmm. He had written Bombassus a letter is 1 John 5, 7 in Vatican, as Bombassus wrote back in 1521, no, it's not in there, guess what? He put it in. So if he was a loyal Roman Catholic, he sure didn't obey him, okay? Mm -hmm. You're, he was a good Roman Catholic. No, he wasn't. He was, uh, I was going to say something, but I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, in light of knowing, in, in fact, he didn't trust the Vatican manuscripts, all right? So uh, in light of knowing that Vaticanus didn't have 1 John 5, 7, his very next edition still had it in because he had two Greek manuscripts that had it in. He didn't trust Vaticanus. He was a very wise man. After him came a guy named Robert, or no, no. Oh, yeah. Robert Stephanus. Robert Stephanus had um, four editions. 1546, 1549, 1550, and 1559. Uh, 1559 <coughs> uh, is important to us and everybody because it broke the Bible into verses. All right? You know, when people complain about the King James Bible, again, you ever hear anybody complain about the King James Bible having italics? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. The Geneva had italics. Mm -hmm. Several Bibles prior to the King James had italics. Several Bibles after. Have you ever heard anybody complain, I don't like the New King James Bible because the italicized words? Because they're in italics. Mm -hmm. right. Have you ever heard anybody say, I don't like the New American Standard Version because it has words in italics? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, it has italicized words. Yeah. I thought italics were bad. Isn't it funny that they're only bad if they're in the King James? Yeah, that's right. I've got in my truck, I, and, and Kathy's got the truck, but I've got, you ever hear anybody say this? Well, the King James Bible has the Apocrypha in it. You hear me? Mm -hmm. In my truck, I've got a new King James Version with the Apocrypha in it, printed by Thomas Nelson Publishers. Mm -hmm. That's a thought. Mm -hmm. so, um, <clears throat> so anyway, so this is, uh, this is when the verses, this is when the verses came. Then you got Theodore Beza. Okay? Theodore Beza had um, actually had ten editions. Uh, he had one in 1565, one in 1582. Now, now all of these guys are building off what Erasmus originally. Uh, did uh, 1589 and 1598 and and five through uh, or, or six uh, five actually five through ten uh, were just basically smaller small revisions of that one. Uh, believe it or not, the important one the important one here is number five. That's the important uh, version of Visa because that is the Greek Testament, New Testament that uh, the King James translators had on the table when they translated our King James Bible. You know, we say that uh, that they used Erasmus. They actually didn't have any edition of Erasmus there, Stephanus. They had Visa's fifth edition, but it was it was all based off of this work. Okay, 
So uh, it was Beza's fifth edition uh, that the King James translators had. Then you've got the L. Zeber brothers. <clears throat> the L. Zeber brothers had, uh, let me see if I got it down here, had two editions, uh, one in 1624 and one in 1633. Um, the one in 1633 changed history. Now, now mind you, it's 22 years after the King James Bible, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. But there's two words, and it's not even in the text, that, that have been on your lips. Yeah. It is in the introduction of the 1633 edition uh, of the El Zebra Brothers Greek New Testament that in Latin they say, and now you have the text that has been received by the church. Mm -hmm. And from that it was, it was the Textus Receptus, and that's right. where the term Textus Receptus came from. Now, for this reason, you'll get our, uh, our adversaries like to say, well, how could the King James be based on a Texas Receptus when it didn't even exist for 22 years? Guys, it existed in 1516. Yeah. It basically existed as we know it after 1522. Um, it just didn't have that name, yeah. all right? So the Greek, test, or the Greek text was around before the King James, but it wasn't officially called. It was just something. They weren't even officially trying to name it. Yeah. It was one of those things that, mm -hmm. that was, it was just kind of like popular. Mm -hmm. It just caught fire. People said, yeah, that's the Textus Receptus, the, the received text. And so um, uh, that's, uh, that's where you got that term from. Now I'm going to have to erase some of this. Oh, no, I don't want that erased. Put <laughs> 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 that back on. <laughs> okay, forget it. Flip yeah. the switch. It's not like my computer. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for the redo button. come to the English. <clears throat> and there were numerous English translations before the King James Bible, and as you know, after. Uh, I will put here again, uh, as far as pre-King James, uh, I will put number one as Wycliffe, because that was the first uh, English Bible, 1380. Now, I just want to give you this. You know, a lot of times, uh, you have, it's like the Internet. Um, you know, gee, guess what I found out? And, and then you found out that it really didn't happen. I mean, nothing like the Internet for good, reliable information. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, the standard teaching is that, that, that Wycliffe translated this from, from Jerome's Latin. Now, Jerome's Latin came into existence in, in uh, that was the one that was in 380. All right? And here's what happened. The Roman Catholic Church needed a, a competitor with the, with the Old Latin. And so uh, they, they had Wycliffe, who was Roman, I mean, I'm sorry, they had uh, Jerome, uh, who was a Roman Catholic priest, uh, uh, translate their corrupt uh, Alexandrian manuscripts into Latin. And because the, the good Latin Bible was known as the Vulgate or Common Bible, and now, again, that was like the Texas Receptus. That was a tag that just stuck. They didn't officially call it the, the, the Vulgate. It just became the Vulgate. It's like this. If you said, what's the common Bible today? It's King James. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you don't like it, love it. I don't care if you're, uh, if you're a TR, I mean a uh, uh, NIV guy. The common Bible is still the King James. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the old Latin was the common Bible, so it was known as the Vulgate. <laughs> So when the Roman Catholic Church had this translation of, uh, of Alexandrian manuscripts uh, translated into, into Latin, they named it the Common Bible. Hmm. So they called it the Vulgate. Hmm. Now let me ask you a question. If you just put it on sale today, how could you dare call it common? Hmm. Nobody's got one yet. Right? right. Mm -hmm. 
I got news for you. Not only did nobody have one in 1680, but they didn't have one in, uh, in, in, I mean in 380. They didn't have one in 480, or 580, or 680, or 780, or 880, or 980, or 1080. This, this book, that Jerome's Latin Vulgate, was ignored by the droves. Because it only took the common man a glance at it to say, this is not the Bible. And that then languished until around 1200. Wow. And around 1200, the Roman Catholic Church found a way. Because see, that what they're thinking is, this, it's kind of like, um, you remember talk radio when it first came on, all conservative? Mm -hmm. And then the liberals said, well, we need talk radio too. Have you ever noticed when I have a talk radio show, it never goes anywhere? That's right. <laughs> yeah. It never goes anywhere. They thought, well, if we have one, we'll just displace all those conservatives. Nobody wants to hear what a liberal has to say. We hear it everywhere. Exactly. We hear it from the president. We hear it from the, from the, from the uh, news media. We hear it from Hollywood. My goodness, man, we don't need what we hear every day. Amen. And so they knew it was a bad Bible, so they ignored this. And so uh, the Roman Catholic Church found a way to get, the, get Christianity to accept uh, their Latin Vulgate. They took all of the old copies of the original Vulgate, the good one, and burned them <laughs> along with the owners mm -hmm. yes, right. and ushered into history the darkest period known as the dark ages okay and and so now when you hear people talk about the Vulcan this is the problem you'll hear somebody you you may pick up an ancient uh, when I say ancient I'm about several hundred year old uh, uh, writing and it talks about the Vulgate being the Bible of the New Testament church and you're going to think, oh, they're talking about Jerome's. No, they're not. So nowadays, to, to show a difference, the old, uh, the, the old Vulgate is known as the Old Latin. They call it the Old Latin instead of the Vulgate, and, and Jerome got, uh, credit, uh, got credit for the Vulgate. Hmm. The first time a Bible... Oh, but here's what I'm going to tell you. This. The standard teaching is that, that, um, that Wycliffe translated uh, Jerome's Latin Vulgate into English. I had a guy send me something. I haven't been able to review it yet. But he says he's got proof that Wycliffe didn't use that, but in some way he used some portion of, the, of what we now know as the received text. Now, if he did, he got a hold of some manuscripts prior to Erasmus even doing his work in 1516. I am not claiming that Wycliffe, you, I am standing with the standard teaching, or standing with the standard teaching that he used the, um, uh, the Vulgate, because you've got to disprove that. Okay? I mean, that is the standard teaching. Um, but I'm telling you that just because I, I want you to hear it. I want it in your head. I want you to know that there is a possibility that Wycliffe actually did translate uh, something from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Antiochian Greek. Now, it doesn't matter if you say, well, it just makes sense to me. Oh, yeah, it makes sense to you. You had it all figured out. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> After him was Tyndale. And this is the first English translation that we know. Uh, came from what we call the Texas Receptus. I'll put 1525, I'm sorry, it's 1526. And, uh, and Tyndale, he actually did do the entire Bible because uh, he was arrested by the Catholic Church and burned. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but um, uh, he did the New Testament. Uh, he had done portions of the, I think he might have got the Pentateuch done, got portions of Joshua done. Um, my head Psalms. He had, he had several books of the Old Testament done. Uh, and then he was captured by the Roman Catholic Church and burned. You know the famous prayer of Tyndale. Tyndale is the one that before they killed him, he said, God opened the eyes of the King of England. Mm. Did God ever answer that prayer? Amen. 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 Yes, I'm telling you, God answered that prayer. Mm. You know, guys, uh, Henry VIII, isn't it funny how God uses some things that we, uh, yep. we think are bad? Mm. I mean, the guy was married eight times. And, and he got married so many times, Roman Catholic Church, I mean, you can only justify so many, so, so many of those. And so they, um, he, he kicked them out. And doing that, he opened the Bible. In, in, um, in 1408, let me tell you this, in 1408, see, I've got this written down here somewhere. In 1408, the Roman Catholic Church issued the Constitutions of Oxford. Now, you have to understand that in 1408, the Roman Catholic Church was the Church of England. I don't mean the Church of England. I mean, it was, there was no Church of England uh, around yet. 
and the Roman Catholic Church was the, the state church. And in 1408, they instituted, they issued the Constitutions of Oxford. This is what it prohibited. No scripture is ever to be printed in English. No one is to ever pray in English. If you were caught with a copy of the Bible in English, you would be burned at the stake. If you were caught praying in English, you were going to die. So you understand, that's why, that is why Tyndale, giving them the Bible in English, it was a capital offense. That's right. Because I'll tell you something, I tell, I'm telling you, you find all these guys, it's not just the Bible. It's the Bible in the hands of the common man. Amen. You, you always heard about the chain Bible, you know, the church had a Bible chained to the, to the, to the uh, communion table up here. You know that if there was a Bible chained to this communion table, that is not the Bible the devil's afraid of. Right. He's afraid of yours. Amen. He's afraid of you guys that go down, well, I was going to say work at the steel mill. Are there any? <laughs> okay, uh, you guys who are cutting grass. <clears throat> anyway, uh, yeah, you know, the new industrial base of America. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the devil is afraid of the common man with the Bible. That is why the devil has got to destroy. If, look, if you can't burn the Bibles, you know what you do? You just make the common man doubt that it's the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Stop and think. Let's say you've got, uh, you, you've got an enemy force of 200 men and surrounded by five separate companies of 100 of ours. Now, 500 against 200, guess who's going to win? So the order is given to all five of these attacks. Well, 500 against 200, we're going to win. But here's what happens. One of those 100, never hear it. One of those just hear a garbled message, but they don't, they don't know what it said. One of them hears attack, but they don't hear the part at what time they're supposed to attack. One of them gets the message loud and clear, but they're not sure it's not the enemy trying to get them to attack separately so that it's 200 against 100 and they lose. So... 400 of the 500 don't, don't move, and 100 get the message clear, and they go to attack, and they get overrun, and they get killed. And then these guys go, oh, gee, it was the right time, but now they go in piecemeal, and one by one. You, you know, guys, in, uh, in 1991, when, um, uh, when, when we attacked Iraq, the first thing we went after was not the Republican Guard. The first thing we went after was not the, the Iraqi anti-missiles, air, air, aircraft missiles. You know what the first thing we went after? Communication. If you're here, it doesn't matter if you are over the most powerful, powerful army in the world. If you can't communicate with them, they're going to sit on their hands. They're not going to do anything. Now, guys, again, stop and think. There is one Christ, right? Amen. And, and there's... Doesn't the devil mess with that and bring out many antichrists? Sure. Yeah. There's one true church. Amen. Doesn't the devil have many churches? Yeah. There's one true God. Doesn't the devil have many gods? Hey, guys, and the devil's going to go, yeah, but I've never messed with the Bible. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Guys, there's one Bible, and there are many anti-Bibles. Yeah. So, um, so Tyndale, <clears throat> Tyndale gave us a Bible uh, in English. The uh, King of England got the message and uh, threw the Roman Catholic Church out. And, um, and that opened the England up to um, the Bibles in English. After Tyndale was a guy named Miles Coverdale. Mm -hmm. Coverdale, <clears throat> uh, his came out uh, about um, 1535. And Coverdale uh, was the first one to segregate the Apocrypha. Um, in, your, in, in the early King James Bibles, uh, they had the Apocrypha between the Testaments. Uh, and, and, you know, we get, uh, the Bible gets uh, blasted by people who don't love the Bible anyway, and they use that as an excuse to say something bad about it. But if you were a Roman Catholic and you had a Roman Catholic Bible, you know that the, the Apocrypha was not between the Testaments. It was dispersed throughout the Old Testament. And Coverdale and Tyndale Hall Company, they didn't believe it was inspired. So they segregated it and put it in between because I'll tell you what it is. It is basically a history of what went on during those 400 silent years between the close of the Old Testament uh, and the beginning of the New. Miles Coverdale, basically what he did, he was, 
Uh, he was um, uh, Tyndale's assistant, and when Tyndale was killed in 1534, 35, um, uh, 36, uh, uh, Coverdale finished his work. Uh, here's an interesting one, and a, and a lesson to be learned. There was a Bible, an English Bible, brought out, and it is the Thomas Matthews version. It was 1537. Now, the reason that's interesting is because the guy that brought that out, what's his name? No. His name is... John Rogers. That's his name. I mean, okay, okay. William Tyndale brought out the Tyndale. Uh, John Wycliffe brought out the Wycliffe. Miles Coverdale brought out the Coverdale Bible. So who brought the Thomas Matthews? John Rod. <laughs> you say, well, why do you do that? He didn't make it that they would arrest him and burn him at the stake, so he put it out under uh, an assumed name. And then the Catholic Church found John Rogers and burned up the stake. <laughs> There's the lesson to be learned, guys. Don't say anything to preserve your life or soul. Amen. They're going to get you anyway. Okay? Don't recant. Don't take a step back. Don't let them scare you into backing up from what you know is true. Well, you know, if you just do this, we won't kill you. They're going to kill you anyway. That's right. So, you know, we could at least have the John Rogers version if you'd be hung on. <clears throat> then came the Great Bible. Great Bible. Uh, two editions of 1539 and 1569. And the Great Bible was called the Great Bible because it was a great Bible. This is not one you're taking on visitation. This would make the one on your coffee table look like a New Testament back pocket edition. Uh, it was the Great Bible. That's, what it was, uh, that's why it was called that. Um, there was the Taverners. Now, let me... Um, let me let me help you. Taverners Bible, that's 15... 35 to 1577. Guys, um, beware. You, you know, I deal in facts. I really do. I deal in historical facts or scriptural facts. I don't deal in pyrotechnics. I don't set off fireworks. Guys like fireworks. Fireworks are cheap. Right? Anybody can light a match and, right. and send a rocket into the sky. Right. Um, it's not as easy to read books or, or to write them. And so... Uh, we get people occasionally, and they'll say, uh, to give an example, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver trying to furnish birth, purified seven, seven times. times. Seven times. You know what those seven times are? Because if you do, I don't. No, no, please, don't come up here and enlighten me. <laughs> well, even I know that. Yep. No, you do not. Okay? Uh, I have heard this. I have heard... Uh, those seven times are seven different languages that the Bible was translated into, and the seventh one was English. Well, that's fine, but I can find more than seven. Oh. Okay, seven English translations, and the King James was a seventh. That's great. I can find more. Okay, the King James Bible was, uh, was not revised, but there were, you know, like spelling corrections and everything else, and seven different editions. I think there were more. Now, I, I do my own work. Occasionally, I have to help somebody else. Uh, yesterday, I had a book to work on, and I had to write something for somebody else's book. And so I spent the day doing that. Um, I don't proofread for anybody. But I did proofread this one book for an Australian brother. And, uh, you know, I was over there preaching for him, and he asked me if, I'd, I would, um, <clears throat> if I would proofread his book. And he subscribes to the seven English translations, and the King James Bible was the seventh one. You know, because that's pyrotechnics. Like, ooh, see that? <laughs> In the list of seven English Bibles, he had Gutenberg. <laughs> Gutenberg, 1456, was Latin. Ah. So I, I proofread his book, and then I, I, I scratched out Gutenberg, and I said Gutenberg was Latin. Now he's got how many? 
So I gave him two other English translations. I said, put this one or this one in, and you'll have seven. <laughs> now, I don't know if he got the lesson. <laughs> but beware of that sensational stuff. Okay? Can I tell you something? That book is sensational. Yeah. That book. You want to see something? Let me, let me give you a little sidebar here. I want to show you how out of date your King James Bible is. Um, we have to be honest. And what we have to be honest about is this. There, there are some things that the King James translators knew nothing about. They could not know anything about. Mm -hmm. They couldn't know anything about air travel. Mm -hmm. right? Right. right? Well, I think they could. Oh, you don't think. <laughs> they didn't know anything about cars, right? right? right. <laughs> they couldn't know anything about telephones, mm -hmm. although they did put in Job, canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say, here we are. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they couldn't know anything about computers or internet or email. I mean, they, there's just things they could not know anything about. If you could go back in time to the King James translator and say, hey, what do you think of, uh, what do you think of the new Corvette? They, th they thought that was a ship. <laughs> because that's what the that's where the car got its name from, a fast ship. So I want to show you how to date your book is. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter twelve. Now I want you to read verse twenty one. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. All right, you read it? Now look at the last word. What's the last word? Quake. Quake. Look at the punctuation right after quake. How could they know? Check out the modern translation. It's not there. How did they, in 1611, put something that we're going to be using in the 21st century on our email? Uh, they didn't know, guys. But isn't it amazing that it's the Bible is still setting the course yes, that all mankind is going to follow? And you know what's funny? There are non-King James Bible believers. There are atheists who will mock the Bible. There are, there are non-King James Bible believers who will mock the King James Bible at us. And at the end of their email, when they're doing it, they'll put, Dun. <laughs> And without saying a word, still quote a 400-year-old book. Mm -hmm. Guys, you ain't getting away from that book. Right. Yeah. Okay, that was free. That was free. <laughs> then came the Geneva. Geneva Bible, uh, first one was in 1560, and that was published until 1644. <coughs> a couple of things that you need to understand about the Geneva Bible. Uh, that was the Bible of the Puritans. And um, um, it was a Bible that the pilgrims had on the Mayflower in 1620. I have no problem. I heard this. I can't believe uh, such a stupid thing. But when he was president, he made a statement. I heard him talking. He said, when the, when the Christians and Jews and Muslims founded this country. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, right. Can I tell you something? There were no Muslims on the Mayflower. Amen. That's right. right. You know how you know? It didn't blow up. It didn't blow up. <laughs> <laughs> Still alive. <laughs> anyway. But now, just try thinking, okay? Because I know it's a painful experience, but try thinking. When did we declare our independence from England? Gee, you guys scare me. You're all public educated. <laughs> then that means that the newest Geneva Bible was over 150 years old. Can you imagine? You think you think they were publicly carrying around 150 year old Bibles? No. And so you've got these people that are claiming that the Geneva was the Bible that the Puritans brought off, the Pilgrims brought off the Mayflower. It was. Then they try to claim that the Geneva Bible was the Bible on which this country was founded. That is a lie. That is a misleading statement. The King James Bible had supplanted it. That's why it quit, they print, quit printing it just 33 years after the King James. It supplanted the Geneva. There's a book back on the table on the Geneva Bible. Um, uh, you know what's amazing? The devil only wants one thing. 
He wants that King James Bible out of your hand. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not going to put that King James Bible down for an NIV, are you? No. American Standard, are you? No. In fact, can I help you with this? Only the American Standard Version is made out of poor. For five years, we thought so highly of the American Standard Version, we built two entire rooms. <laughs> just for our American Standard Version. In fact, I thought that you can use the American Standard and the King James at the same time. <clears throat> so I'm talking to a group of people, and you would never pick up an NIV, and you would never pick up a New American Standard, and you'd never pick up uh, even a New King James, right? right? And I come into a church, and a pastor says, hey, I got a good couple out here, King James, now they're using the Geneva. And it's this prideful thought of, well, if the 1611 is good, then how about the one before? It's got to be even better. Right. No. That's some real punishment. I medal in heaven for that. <laughs> it's like having four root canals with no, no Novocaine. All right, let me ask. And, and so here's the thing. People that would never pick up, put their King James down for an NIV, in pride will put it down for a Geneva. Mm -hmm. Because it does come from the correct manuscript. Now, how many of you have ever heard about this? 2 Samuel 21, 19. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the brother of being in italics, right? Mm -hmm. And Elhanan the brother, uh, killed the brother of italics, and the brother of his in italics, yeah. and it's because it was not in the Hebrew. And, and so the NIV takes that, the brother of, out of that verse, making Elhanan killing Goliath, and, and yet in right. 1 Samuel 17 it says, David killed Goliath, you have a contradiction in your Bible. Mm -hmm. You think the NIV is wrong for that? Yes, yes. Guys, that was really lame. You, you're so stinking scared to be committed. To, I'm telling you. Was the NIV wrong for yes. that? Yes. 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 Well, don't blame them. They got it from the Geneva. Hmm. That's what the Geneva does back hmm. Uh How about this? And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. You going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Amen. <laughs> Not if you got a Geneva. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord for a long season. Mm. Wow. Hey, bucko, mm -hmm. there's no revolving door on heaven for me. <laughs> Amen. I'm not going up and they're saying, okay, you're, you're expired now. <laughs> I'm dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. But here's my favorite. This is my favorite of the Geneva. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, 315, 215, 215, where it says God hateth putting away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what the Geneva says? If thou hatest her, put her away. <laughs> now wait, I know there's something wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, Geneva's a pretty good Bible, you know? Anyway, so all I'm telling you is, if you're getting romanced by a Geneva Bible, I'll tell you why. You're proud. You're proud and you think you're going to one-up. You can't one-up perfection. Right. Amen. Hey, you want an easy job? Everybody wants an easy job. I'm going to give you the easiest job in the world. Take a King James Bible, typeset, and change one word, not two, just one. If you typeset that book and change one word, you know what you did? You made perfect imperfect. Is that not easy? Mm -hmm. So the Geneva, though it is from the Texas Receptus, though it is from the right manuscript line, it is not the perfect Bible. That one is the perfect Bible. Amen. Amen. After the Geneva was <clears throat> the bishops. Bible. And that is uh, <coughs> 1565, 1602. Now, uh, the bishops' Bible, two things I want you to note, uh, note about this. The bishops' Bible was the uh, Bible of the Anglican Church, the, the Church of England. The Geneva was the Bible of the Puritans. Uh, these are kind of like the spiritual equivalent to the Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> really, really. And, um, and these guys, the Puritans, didn't like these guys. That's right. They thought they were a bunch of religious Pharisees. These guys, the Church of England, thought these guys, they didn't think they were Pharisees, they thought they were heretics, and they're, they're, they wanted to burn them at the stake. Okay, that's what that's what their idea was. So these guys don't like each other, but they still both had a pretty good Bible. I mean, the Geneva is not perfect, but it's better, uh, even though it has an I Actually, it doesn't have an NIV reading. The NIV has a Geneva reading. Hmm. But um, but this was the this was the Bible of the Church of England, uh, and that is the Bible of Puritans. I'll explain why I told you that uh, in a little while. 
And then there was this one, which is not. Uh, oh, let me give you this. You just might want to know this. Uh, of the Geneva, there were 140 editions. Wow. Wow. I, I, have, I have a 1560 New Testament. Um, this Geneva that's going around is supposed to be a 1599. I've got a... No, 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 no. This is wrong. This is wrong. Fifteen fifty-seven. Now the fifteen sixty date is not entirely wrong. Fifteen fifty-seven is when the Geneva New Testament was done, and in fifteen sixty the entire Bible was done. I've got a I've got a Geneva fifteen fifty-seven edition New Testament. I've got a Geneva fifteen sixty. And then I've got this, this so-called 1599. Uh, on my book it says uh, the Geneva 2006 edition. Uh, and the reason it says that is because if you'll actually read that, two, that 1599 Geneva that they're putting out, in the introduction, you can read that. You're allowed to. It says this is a revision, or this is a copy of a, of a 2006 revision of the 1599. But anyway, have you ever heard anybody say this about your King James Bible? Well, you know, well, which King James Bible do you use? Yeah. Do you use a 1611? Or do you use a, a, a 1638 or a 1769? But if you will check it out, and, and again, guys, one of the things, if you, will, if you will study this subject, you really ought to get some material and read it on your own. It really does strengthen you. And, and so in this Geneva book that I have back there, um, I compare... I compare um, verses in the Wycliffe, Tyndale, I'm trying to think if i got a Coverdale, a uh, Great, um, I might have Taverners, Geneva, Bishops, um, that might be it, that might be it. But anyway, if you, if you ever read the difference in editions, I did not say revisions, I said editions of your King James Bible. Right. They all read the same. Yeah. Exactly. In the Geneva, from, from, from revision to revision, things change radically. They literally took one word out and put a different word in. Or, in some cases, a chapter had 31 verses in one edition, and in the next one it had 32 because they split a verse and added a verse, you know, and, and made it two verses. And, and the reason I say that is because it's remarkable. I'm, I'm not looking for this when I'm reading. But I'm realizing how consistent this one is. This one has not changed. Amen. So there were 140 editions of the Geneva. And there were uh, 19, 19 uh, editions of the bishops. And of course the bishops didn't care because they were reading the Bible anyway. But anyway, uh, then down here around 9, uh, you got the Douay Reims. And the Douay Reims is not a good Bible. I only put it in here because it was 1582. Uh, it did precede our King James Bible. But that, uh, where it is different uh, from all of these others, uh, it's different in several ways. Number one, it's an official Roman Catholic Bible. Number two, it was translated from the Latin uh, and, the, and the Greek from Alexandria, not from the Texas Receptus. I'm just putting it up there uh, so that you can see that um, uh, where it was in the order uh, of things. And then, you got the King James Bible of 1611. Now, occasionally people ask me a question that no one on earth can answer. And I don't try to answer those kind of questions. Um, they are question like this. Uh, somebody will say, why didn't the King James translators do this? Or why did they do this? Well, who can know? I mean, who can know? Or, why did God use this one and not that one? Well, nobody can know. All right? And if somebody tells you they do know, don't buy the prayer cloth either. <laughs> but I get this question asked many times, <clears throat> why King James? I mean, there were, there were English Bibles prior to the King James, and why the King James? Why is King James? 
In fact, I had a guy tell me this. He was going to really put me in my place, and he just devastated my, my faith. <laughs> <laughs> and he said this. He said, okay, I can understand being a perfect English. Why this one? Now, now guys, understand something. Now that you believe the King James Bible, you're prejudiced in its faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in here a little bit, you're afraid that somebody may show you some problem. Or to ask a question, or to, to address a question uh, about it, it kind of scares you. And so here's what this guy said. He said, he said, there were all of these, why didn't God use one of these? Why the King James? That's ridiculous. It's, uh, he would say, he said this, it's arbitrary. In other words, it's like putting all these English Bibles up there and you're going, yeah, I think it's this one. Right? He said it's ridiculous to believe the King James is the perfect English Bible. Now, he thinks I'm going to be on the defensive, but, oh, I don't want anybody to call me ridiculous. I feel bad about that. Okay? <laughs> Done feeling bad. And I said this instead. I, I use what I call spiritual judo. <laughs> instead, when somebody's coming at me or something, I don't resist them. I grab them and throw. I assume that they're right. I just, and I said, you're right. Guys, I want you to know it is ridiculous. I mean, there's no, there's no metric by which you can say the 10th English Bible is going to be the perfect one. Or the one done by King James is going to be the perfect one. So why this one? And it is ridiculous of all the pre-King pre James Bible, why that one? Why not, why, not, why not one before? Why not one after? And I told him, I said, you're right. I said, believing that, that not only that an English translation is the perfect word of God, but it's the King James, like not one before, could, would it make more sense? Would it make more sense that the first English one would be the perfect one? Mm -hmm. That would kind of make sense. Anyway, I said, it is ridiculous to believe the King James Bible is the perfect word of God. And I said, and you, you know, you're just too kind of uh, academic to, to believe the ridiculous, right? And he, was, he took that as a compliment. <laughs> and he said, yes, I just can't, you know, I just can't accept the ridiculous. I said, I said, yo, you wouldn't accept the ridiculous. But I said, <clears throat> but you believe you're going to fly through the air at the sound of a trumpet without an airplane. Mm. He said, yeah. And that's not ridiculous? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I said, and, and you believe that somebody hit the Red Sea with a stick? Yeah. And it parted, and they walked across some dry ground, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I said, uh, I think that qualified for ridiculous. I said, how about manna on the ground six days a week for 40 years? <laughs> how about somebody walking on water? How about somebody being dead and coming back to life? How about somebody hanging on a cross 2,000 years ago and somehow paid for the, yeah, for the sins right. of someone who wasn't even born yeah, right. yet? I'm sorry, guys. It's all ridiculous. That's right. I told him, I said, yes. I said, me believing the King James Bible is ridiculous. But I said, I said, it's way down on a long list of ridiculous things that I believe. Amen. Yeah. And I got news for you. When you look at the ridiculous things, that, I mean, come on, you believe that trusting the death, burial, resurrection, and the blood of Jesus Christ, paying for your sin, and now you're going to heaven? Guys, I'm sorry. That's why some people are going to hell. Because what you believe is ridiculous. That's right. Yeah. And it is. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's so ridiculous you can't figure it out, you almost have to like have faith. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about this King James Bible. King James Bible... Uh, you know, you, you'll have people say that uh, that King James didn't want to translate the Bible. Oh, whoa, whoa. Let me let me give you let me give you this why. One of the questions I get, one of the why questions is, why the King James? Why why not one of these? Yeah. Well, obviously, I do not know. Let me give you what I think. What I think is that prior to the King James, every other English Bible was one of two things. It was a one-man translation. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. These were one-man translations. Yeah. Actually, Geneva was too. I think Coverdale did. But, but it was... Or... One group. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. They say, well, it's King James. That's one man. He didn't touch it. That's right. That's right. He didn't yeah. touch it. Right. Yeah. And, and you ever hear anybody say... Um, 
Oh, the King James translators were a bunch of Episcopalian baby sprinklers. No, half of them were. <laughs> the other half were rabid heretic Puritans. Yep. The King James Committee, you know what it was like? It was like, honest, having the Democrats and the Republicans yeah. Yeah. translate a Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Anglicans kept it from being an all-Puritan Bible, and the Puritans mm -hmm. kept it from being an all-Anglican all Bible, and the fact that it was a committee kept it from being a one-man translation. So the King James Bible was the first English translation that was not one man yeah. or one group. Now, I don't know that that is why God uh, used it, I'm just telling you that's the historical fact. You can, you can uh, figure it is that that's where it is or not. Uh, and I hear people say, you know, that King James was forced. By, you, if you know anything about King James, nobody forced him to do anything. Yeah. I get this. Uh, I get this book I picked up in Scotland last year on King James. He became king of Scotland when he was a year old, and and he was uh, Scotland was um, uh, it was uh, what I would say ruled by a regent, because obviously you don't let a one year old play with the country. I think that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> but when King was old, this five-year-old, when he was five years old, he addressed what would be like the equivalent of the Scottish Parliament, like the, the Scottish rulers of his country, that he was. And he told them, and I've got to paraphrase this, but he told them to be to be uh, to, to to choose wisely in all the decisions that they made, mm. because he said, he said when you're done, you will answer to God and afterward to me. Mm. Wow! <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hit you with my teddy bear. I mean, <laughs> the guy was tough. Yeah. He was tough. Nobody pushed this guy around. He was. He was King James the sixth Scotland. Now you know what that means. That means that prior to him becoming King of England, or King of Scotland, Scotland had five other kings by the name of James, so he became King James the sixth. When, when in um, 1603 he ascended the English throne, England had never had a king by the name of James. So, if, it, if his name had been Henry, he'd have been Henry the ninth. Okay, so his title was changed in England to King James the First. Okay, by the way, this is a whole this is a whole sermon. I don't think I've got the notes in here, but but let me give you what this guy was. You know what, you know what the whole thing was? King James Stuart. Uh, you may find it spelled S-A-R-T, and you say, well, you're spelling it different. I saw it spelled that way in the museums in Scotland. And Stuart is what? Guys, you don't say a Stuart is a Stuart. Sick bunch of people out there. What is a Stuart? Guardian. Guardian, yeah. Custodial care. Servant. Servant. Custodian. Right. So here, you have <clears throat> what it says in Ecclesiastes, the word of, where the word of the king is, there's power. Amen. So he was a king. Mm -hmm. Here, you have Jacob. Right? Yep. That's James. James mm -hmm. the, is, the, is the English equivalent to Jacob. Jacob is the guy that Israel is all about. He is Israel. Mm -hmm. And here, you have a steward He's a custodian. He's a caretaker. You say, what did he take care of? He took care of everything. Mm. I'm telling you everything. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that kings were known for was being um, promiscuous. They, they grab a chambermaid and head for a room. You know that in all of history there's not one innuendo or insinuation that he ever did anything like that? Mm. One of the things that kings are known for is being despotic. In other words, they are absolute rulers. I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to tell you, this guy believed in the absolute rule of a king. He believed in what was known as the um, uh, divine right of kings. You would not like what he believed about being a king. He believed, if I said it, that settles it. 
Right. Okay? He actually believed the same thing that Obama believes. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that as a joke. This mm -hmm. guy thinks like That's a right. dictator. That's, That's right. 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 And he believed that a king was a dictator. The problem is, you heard it, power corrupts right. and absolute power. Absolutely corrupts. And he thought he was an absolute power. There's no record of him being a despot. In fact, the first book he wrote, he was one of the most educated men of his time. Most kings were illiterate and ignorant men, un uneducated. You know why? They didn't have to know anything. Mm -hmm. right. They get somebody to do everything for them. <clears throat> I mean, really, somebody reads for him. You know what this guy would do? When he was eating, he had a guy standing behind him reading books. By the time he was seven years old, he could read a chapter of the Bible. No, 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 I take that back. He could quote from memory a chapter of the Bible in Latin, translate it on the spot into French, then translate the French into English. <coughs> Wow. He was one of the most learned men. You know, we always say he was not in on the translation of the Bible, and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, when it said learned men, he qualified. Mm -hmm. He did. He qualified. And the first book he wrote was the Basilican Dor Dorian. You know what that was? That was called the kingly gift. You know who the gift was to? It was to his son, Henry. Henry, was he died, uh, so he never took the throne, but he was destined to take his throne. Uh, so Charles took it. And in this, you know what he said? Here's what this man took care of. Um, he wrote that. He said, you should be moral. He said, you should be true to your wife. By the way, he was not a queer. He, he, dis, he despised the effeminate. This guy was a hunter. You know what? You guys, how many hunters? Okay. He'd whip you up. He hunted the woods next to his house completely out of game. <laughs> they had to restock it. <laughs> he, had a, he had a disease, and I can't remember the name of it, but he was bow-legged. His tongue was too large for his mouth. He drooled. He was not a he was not a he was not the kind of guy like uh, you know, they didn't want Errol Flynn to play King James. It was, it was more like Dom DeLuise. <laughs> but you see, because of that, I mean who could take Dom DeLuise seriously? Right? right. <laughs> but he would have trouble sitting on the back of a horse. So when he went hunting, he had them tie him to the saddle so he could go hunt. Oh, he's a cool guy. Um, and in this Basilica in Dorian, he told, his, he told his son, the future king, to treat his people right, to treat his wife right. He told his son to be clean, physically clean. Because you have to understand, at this, at this time, they were not clean. Can I tell you, can I tell you something about castles? You been? You ever see uh, an outhouse? Okay, board with a hole in it. You know, you know what the hole's for. A king had one of those in his chamber. Some of them were like a throne. An open, maybe two stories down. And and that would get a cross job was to stir this. This is a wonderful job. And the fumes of that were ammonia. And so what they would do is they would, the, the, the uh, people that took care of the clothes would hang their clothes above that opening so the ammonia would come up and kill the lice. Oh, that's amazing. That's an amazing, thoughtful thing. Not that I want to do it. <laughs> it's going green. Yeah, it's going green. <laughs> green was the exact color I had in mind here. That'll work. But it's just amazing that we, you know, that this guy was a trinity. Uh, he, he was a king, he was Jacob, and yet he was a servant. And he served his people, even though he was, uh, he believed in the divine right of kings, he was a servant. All right, he came to the throne of England. Get this. He came to the throne in 15, or I'm sorry, 1603. Now, have you ever had anybody try to talk you into anything? I hope it took him a while. Mm -hmm. If anybody talked him into this, he declared there'd be a new translation in 1604. <coughs> Wasn't much talking. Because yeah. you know what he wanted? He wanted his people to have a copy of the Bible in their language. That's right. right. Amen. That's you right. see, nobody had done that. That's incredible. I told you. The Puritans had theirs, and the Anglicans would never pick it up. 
The Anglicans had theirs, and the Puritans never pick it up. And basically, these guys might have one of these, maybe even some of the English people, but nobody had, there was no Bible for the common man, directly for the common man. I'm telling you guys, you talk about a, a benevolent king. This man was a benevolent king. So in 15, uh, 1603, he became king. In 1604, he decreed that there would be a new translation. And in 1605, what was known as the gunpowder plot? Because I told you, the one thing they don't want is the common man to have the letters. But uh, <laughs> here, they turn that vial of faggots. Anyway, we can't it's a fuse. We call it a fuse. They call it two light. You know, here, it's what this covering was going to do is when Parliament <laughs> came together with the king. You see, King James, when he became king of Scotland, his other Roman Catholic, no. he was raised by, even though he was a Presbyterian in his later years, um, uh, he was raised by a Presbyterian, one of the guys, two tutors, who was uh, this guy, went back, now language, Roman Catholic. That door being put, slip a Bible through it. Mm. A crack in the door of history. Amazing thing. Wow. <clears throat> so what the Roman Catholic Church plan was, they were going to kill everybody in Parliament, that would kill the king, they were going to take his and in the throne, make him a Roman Catholic, and bring the Roman Catholic Church uh, power in the uh, uh, in England. So in 1604, he he initiated the translation, King, King, translation of the King James Bible. It was published. I didn't bring this. Uh, the King James translators had uh, Lana Andrews. What do you guys do on vacation? I'll bet you don't do what Lancelot Andrews did. Lancelot Andrews was a Puritan. Lancelot Andrews would take a month off. Ooh, that's what I want, a month off. Yeah, you know what he did for his month? He went to the continent and learned a language. Mm -hmm. That's what you guys do, right? <laughs> right? He could speak fluently 15 languages. He would publicly debate. He'd been raised Roman Catholic and got saved. Many of the King James translators had been raised in Roman Catholic homes and got saved and left Amen. the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. Um, some of them, in their teen years, debated publicly against the Romanists in Greek. So when you say, well, these scholars say, these scholars, are today's scholars, they are sandbox level to the King James, King James Translation. One of them, uh, was, it, was it Hadrian Sarabaya? Hadrian, I believe it was Hadrian Sarabaya. I'm seeing it. I have to try to read. Hadrian Sarabaya, I believe it was, wrote a Persian dictionary. <laughs> and so what are you doing? Uh, Tom Bedwell's rule equations. I mean, these guys were these were these guys were little. These were the atomic scientists of their day. That's all I can tell you. All right. Yeah, that is dates. Anyway, he died in 1625. Now, here's a couple things you've got to understand about, about this age. Hey, um, you, know who's, you know who's putting tires around the heads of Africans in Africa and setting them on fire? Who? Africans. <laughs> Not white guys. Black guys are killing black guys in Africa. You know who's killing white guys in Bosnia? Not black guys. White guys. You know what the key word here is? Gang. <coughs> Try. <coughs> Think about those two words. Mm -hmm. When you read about gang warfare, take the word gang out of the of news article, read Tribe, and you'll understand exactly what's happening mm -hmm. in our country. Those black guys are killing those black guys, not because of their race, because they're not the right tribe. Mm -hmm. Those white guys are killing those other white guys, not because of their race, because <laughs> of the wrong tribe. Right. Okay? You know what your problem is? If I put a limey here, if I put a Brit here, and I put a Scot here, you would see the same guy. You would not see the same guy. No. I mean, it's like, yeah, do we not know what Brits are? I mean, are they not better than everybody in the whole world? Right? Well, I got news for you. If evolution was true, Scots are just below apes. <laughs> I don't mean that's what I feel. That's what the Brits feel, the English. They don't like Scots. Right. You know King James was? He's a Scot. And he's the king over Brits, English. 
this low life is telling these Englishers what to do. Do you understand how excited they were about that? <laughs> Number two, most of his court came with you know, Now, there were some English men in the court. And um, uh, one of those guys was a guy by the name of Anthony Weldon. He was English. He had a blood hatred. He saw them. He saw them like Southerners look at black people. That's how he looked at Scots. And he's English, and he's being run by a bunch of Scots. <laughs> There's something else you got to remember. We are in a country where if you want it, you can get it, and we're all equal, correct? Right. But in, in, that, in that system, you were only special if you were in the court. That's right. Anthony Weldon was a member of King James Court. Mm -hmm. Anthony Weldon, in his hostility toward the Scots, went a little too far. Now, now what this meant, guys, is this meant that your children had benefits that the children of the serfs did not get. Right. Mm -hmm. That you got monetary gifts that the common people did not get. Right. That you got land, you could be a land owner and had those guys work on your land. This was, you wanted to be a member of the court. And King James finally put Weldon out of his, out of the court. And Weldon swore vengeance because the Scot, I mean, he was being put out by his lesser, is how he saw it. And he swore vengeance. King James died in 16... 50, uh, 25. It wasn't until 1650, that's 25 years after he was dead, that Anthony Weldon began to spread a rumor that King James was homosexual. And 25 years after the man was dead, there were still enough people alive in England that knew him so well that that rumor went nowhere. But it was in ink. It was written down. And then anti-King James Bible people over here picked it up some years ago. Moody, uh, Moody Monthly had an article about King James and the Bible named after him, and it talks about him being a queer. Do you know how you know he wasn't a queer? There's one way you can tell. You know how you know? Oh, it's an easy one. The queers don't claim him. You think they don't want him out of the closet? You think the homosexuals yeah. in this country would like to say, see, even King James was? Yeah. Have you ever heard one say that? Come on, man. Couldn't they find the book? How come they couldn't find the reference that every anti-King James Christian can find? Because they know he wasn't. Because they know he hated the effeminate. He said that uh, there were some sins that shouldn't... He told his son in the in Basilican Dorian... He said, there are some sins that are to never be forgiven. Murder, sodomy, and, and uh, I think adultery. But he thought that sodomite should die. This guy was not a queer. So guys, that's where, if you're wondering where that, that came from, it came from a guy named Anthony Weldon. And it came in 15, uh, 1650, uh, 25 years after the guy was dead. You know, dead men usually don't fend themselves much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if you really think there's nothing wrong with that, then I hope 25 years after you're dead, somebody says you were one. Because yeah. we'll all be dead. It won't matter. Let me tell you what's left us. This guy left us. Well, he left us. You, you know what he did? He united England, Ireland, and Scotland. It was him that came up with the idea of Britain. You guys may. You know what the, you know what the uh, British flag looks like? Yeah. You know what the, the flag of England looks like? Yeah. I just talked about two different flags. The flag of England is this. Some really artistic ability. I know you're impressed. <laughs> <laughs> the flag.
king of Scotland. Is this. James wanted these two to unite. King James himself designed a flag that incorporated that one and that one. So he came up with a flag that looks like this. It's known as the Union Jack. Isn't it amazing? I mean, the Brits, one thing to say about the Brits, they like their flag like we like ours. Yeah. I mean, they do. They love their flag. Mm -hmm. King James gave it to them. Mm -hmm. King James designed that flag. Mm -hmm. King James established England, Ireland, Scotland together as a great Britain. That's what he wanted. He, laid, he built the foundation, and this was tough. I'm telling you, this was very difficult. But he built the foundation upon which the British Empire was built. Britons. Called them British? That was his word. This was his flag. This is his Bible. Yeah. This man has touched history like nothing Amen. you've ever seen. He's an amazing man. He is, he is greatly appreciated in history. The world hates him because he gave us that book. And now they probably, he did, uh, you know, put the country together as, a, as an empire. Well, I think I'm about done. Um, you know the rest as far as uh, 1881, uh, the RV coming in, uh, Westcott and Hort. You guys, you should know that. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Could you talk a little bit about maybe what they believed a little bit? Yeah, Westcott and Hort. <clears throat> uh, Westcott and Hort were, uh, it was... Uh, Brooke Falls, Westcott, and Fenton John Anthony Hort. They were two Anglicans. Let me tell you, let me tell you what went on in um, 1835 to 1845. Two great things happened there. One of those, that was the that was the years of the great Texas Republic. Which has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. That was just, <laughs> <laughs> but the Texans would appreciate that. Um, in 1835 to 1845, let me, let me tell you, I read a couple of books on a thing called the Oxford Movement. Yeah. The Oxford Movement changed what I believe. And here's what I used to believe. I used to believe that, that this, whoops, alright, say that's Good, straight Bible doctrine. I used to believe that apostasy was this. I used to think that somewhere down here, you know, you know, if you ever come to like not a, not a four point, but like you got a road that's a five points, six points, mm -hmm. and these roads at first, I mean, you can <clears throat> when you take this one, you can look right over and see trap on the other one, right. Mm -hmm. But a mile away, you're too far to see each other. And I used to believe that this was apostasy. I used to believe that apostasy came in kind of like blind, the people that were being blind to it. I read a book, a, a book on the Oxford Movement. That's what this was. This was the Oxford Movement. The Oxford Movement of, of 1835 to 1845 was a bunch of Anglican playing 
low back Catholic Church. Just two things at a time. Well, let's. They pierced. And in 1845, got uh, uh, an Anglican by the name of John Henry Newman went to visit a Roman Catholic priest on a cold night. Uh, the, the, Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic priest, I mean, came to visit Henry Newman, John Henry Newman, and he was warming himself at the fire because it was raining and it was cold. And he turned around to find John Henry Newman on his knees before him, saying, "Will you hear my confession?" Oh. Mm. In 1845, John Henry Newman left the Church of England and joined the Roman Catholic Church became a Roman Catholic priest. Uh, in the early days of this country, they had Newman clubs. Anybody ever hear those? Okay. They had Newman clubs that were designed to bring Protestants into the Roman Catholic Church. Within one year, over 150 Anglicans joined the Roman Catholic Church. This is, what, this is where I've changed on what I believe. I no longer believe that apostasy happens in ignorance or gradually. I'll tell you what they do. Go for the leadership. And the leadership says, group, we're going this way. You want to see it happen? You probably did. It was called the contemporary movement. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah, sir. Where guys came into choir practice and the guy says, what we used to believe, we don't want to believe. Yep. There was no slow introduction. Right. Apostasy is, I know what I'm doing, I know the change I'm making, and I'm making it. Mm. Alright, so that was the Oxford movement. That set up a, a, a Roman Catholic mentality. What's gotten Hort? were two Anglicans, but they were Roman Catholics uh, in heart. Uh, they both believed in adoration of Mary. Uh, they both believed in prayer to saints. Uh, they, did not, they did not believe salvation was by grace. Uh, they did not believe that the Bible was true. They didn't, believe that there, they didn't believe that Moses or David ever really existed. Mm -hmm. They thought that's just Jewish poetry. You're just reading poetry, Jewish, you know, you give them here. It'd be like, uh, it'd be like the man without a country. You know, remember that that great work of fiction? There's people still think there was a guy on a boat and never got to see America. Again. Somebody said, you mean it wouldn't? <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> all right, now, in... Um, I want, again, I'm, I'm trying to give you a thought. In, uh, in, in 1881, the Church of England said we're going to update the King James Bible. We're going to revise it. That became known as the Revised Version. Their mandate was take the King James and make whatever changes you have to. You have no business changing the Greek text. So the Revised Version was supposed to be, was supposed to be founded on the Texas Receptus. What Scott and Hort, their word for the Texas Receptus was vile. <laughs> That was their word. Villainous. That was their word. They detested the, the, the Texas Receptus. They worked on their own Greek New Testament and, and they brought it in clandestinely and supplanted the Texas Receptus. Well, now stop and think about this, guys. What's going to happen when this Bible comes out and it's founded on a Greek, New, on a Greek Testament text that isn't even available publicly? So you, they published their text before the revised version. Eight days. They published it eight days before the revised version so that number one, nobody could say that the revised version was based on a, on a text that wasn't even published. Mm -hmm. And number two, nobody could review that text in eight days to say it was corrupt. Mm -hmm. So Westcott and Hort supplanted the mandate of the revised version <clears throat> and they, uh, they brought out, it was based on, a, on uh, Alexandrian manuscripts, and that was the beginning, okay? That was the beginning. Let me, uh, let me give, you a, give you something else I got from history that I did not, I did not, um, uh, I was wrong. That's okay, I'm right now. <laughs> <laughs> when do you suppose this King James only, by the way, you do understand everybody's King James only? You say, oh no, preacher, oh yeah, I'm telling you, now you remember these words. Every Christian is King James only. Oh no, no, I know Christians. He he, he used the NIV, and I know another ones. Uh, he, he used the Numeric Standard. No, I said they're King James only. 
You are King James only in that you think only the King James is the perfect word of God. They are King James only in that that's the only one they badmouth. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. I told you. They'll complain about the italics in the King James Bible. They won't complain about the italics in the, in the, uh, in the New King James or New American Standard. Okay, I interrupted myself. Now I... <laughs> Can somebody remember what I was saying? You were wrong. You were wrong about something. Yeah, and then King James only. Is yeah, yeah, I, mean, I was wrong, and then I got right. I remember. <laughs> but you see, see, you know how your mind blanks out those those crises in your life, and me being wrong is a. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. Oh, yeah. When you suppose this, the King James Bible is the Word of God. Idea came. When did it start? It's got to have a start. Now, we know it happened at least sometime after 1611. <laughs> you know what I thought? I thought, here. Oh, there were some, there were some other translations prior to the, to the RV, but this was the first official anti-King James translation. And here's what I thought. I just assumed that that must be what triggered the, the no, I don't want the R RV. It's the King James only. That's what I thought. And I was reading amongst those many. I was reading this book written in 1824. And in 1824, this guy is writing uh, against a new translation, and he's saying why they should use the King James. He's not a King James only guy. He's more what we call a TR guy. And in this book, he says about himself. I do not, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think we should have this new translation, but he said, now, I don't believe the King James is absolutely perfect like some people do. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. You know what that guy did? With that one statement verified that there were people walking around in 1824 that believed what you believe. Amen. Yeah, that's right. And the thing about it is, I can't figure out where it got started. Really, I can't figure out where this thing got started. Maybe it got started with one of the pre-RV English translations. I don't know. But when somebody says, well, you don't hear about it before 1950. Oh, yeah. Like how about 125 years before 1950? I think, I think this guy's name was Ruck. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't. My one guy says give Ruck but too much credit. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's Westcott Hoard. Anything else? Okay, he's, he's asking about these and thou. Uh, nothing I can say other than, you know, people say that's hard to understand. It's really not hard to understand. They may not like reading them, but they're not hard to understand. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Did you ever hear this? The is singular, ye is plural? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. What's your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Bible. Bible. Look at Job. Chapter 18. You've got, um, hang on a second. You've got Eliaphaz and Bildad and Zophar. Right. And they are, they are Job's right. oh, he's glad his enemies didn't show up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so he's talking to them. And who are they talking to? Him. Yeah. Him. Right. Is he singular? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite, saying, how long will it be ere make an end of work? Who did he just call ye? And uh, if you read any stuff from from sixteen eleven, uh, you will find ye was also a plural or was also a sing had a singular usage. The only reason I'm telling you that is just don't buy into everything everybody tells you. But brother, I don't know what to say other than. Um, it's the contention. The usual contention about these and thou's are the Bible, that makes the Bible hard to read and hard to understand. I say this. Other versions may be easier. I mean, I can't even say easier to read. Mm -hmm. no. I can prove that. Right. But they're not easier to understand. Now, here's what I want you to do. And you shouldn't have trouble doing this. Some of you do it automatically. Imagine you're God. <laughs> okay, you're God. I had a 
bottle of water somewhere. Yeah, oh. <laughs> okay, you're God, and you're trying to talk to people down here, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what's hampering you? These and those. And, our, and, and old are the English, not old English, it's actually modern, but the English of our King James Bible. Wouldn't you as God? Now, if something is easier to read, then it's easier to understand. If it's easier to understand, then the message gets through where it would have gotten through where it's hard to understand. Amen. You read it. Um, party of the first part says, the party of the second part says, let's say it's right. any. Right. What did this guy say? He said, get out of Dodge. <laughs> right? Right. If you were God and you were hampered in speaking to humans down here through the difficult to read King James Bible, where's the revival that should be brought on by one of these modern translations? If they're easier to read and easier to understand, wouldn't God have an easier time yeah. telling people to get that sin out of yeah. your life? Yeah. Where's the revival? Mm. There's no revival. Yeah, I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove something about, about not being easier to understand here in a second. But I'm also going to tell you this. Um, in um, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, 18, uh, a good tree, tree bringing forth good fruit and an evil tree bringing forth evil fruit, right? right? Good tree. Well, like what kind of good fruit? How about America? Yeah. Amen. Okay. Guys, this nation was not founded on free enterprise. The Puritans did not come here to start right. Pizza Hut. That's correct. <laughs> they came here to worship God. Amen. 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 Right. Exactly. And this is the Bible that has brought liberty. This is the Bible that sparked the great reformations, right. the, the great uh, awakenings in right. this country. In other words, we have ample fruit from the King James Bible. Amen. Right. Oh, wait a second. If an evil tree, if a good tree brings forth good fruit, evil tree brings forth evil fruit, where's the fruit of modern translation? Mm. Right. You say no revival. That's not fruit. That's